On October 24, 2005, in a small town called Ocilia, Georgia, students and teachers gathered for a school day at Irwin County High. But one teacher, Tara Grinstead, who was 30 years old, didn't show up. This was strange because she was always on time. Her classroom was locked and students had to wait outside. Tara lived alone and didn't have a partner or children. She was studying for a PhD in education and was busy with her work. The last time anyone saw her was on Saturday. She had helped young girls preparing for a pageant in the morning, and then she hung out with friends at a barbecue. She got home late that night around 11 p.m. When the police went to her house, they found no signs of anyone breaking in. Her car was in the driveway, but her purse and keys were missing. Her phone was still charging. Everything seemed normal in the house except for a broken lamp in her bedroom. At first, it seemed like she had gone out somewhere. But what was strange was that her dog was left outside alone, and Tara's friends said she would never leave her dog like that. Her cat also hadn't been fed. Tara's pets were everything to her, and she would never have left without ranging care for them, and she certainly wouldn't have left her dog outside for multiple days. Detectives knew Tara had returned home after the cookout because the outfit she'd been wearing was found on the floor in her bedroom. For days, local law enforcement searched for Tara. Massive search parties went out every day and hundreds of tips were followed up with. Many had hoped Tara had simply picked up and run off to start a new life, but those closest to Tara knew that just wasn't in her nature. Neither her bank card nor her credit cards had been used after her disappearance, which was also a sign that she hadn't left her life. Voluntarily, Tara was extremely busy. In Tara's front yard, a latex glove had been discovered, and this turned into one of the only pieces of evidence found. It led detectives to believe that someone with intimate knowledge of police procedure had abducted Tara. Their lead suspect was Tara's ex-boyfriend, who had retired from the military and had briefly worked as a police officer, though there was no evidence directly connecting him to the case. He also had a strong alibi for that weekend. The other piece of evidence was a business card wedged in Tara's front door. The card had been a local business and also led to a dead end. Eventually, the case went cold. In August 2016, the podcast Up and Vanished aired its first episode. The series focused on Tara's disappearance and became hugely popular across the globe, and it had also gotten people talking locally, which in turn reinvigorated the investigation. The podcast interviewed various people in Tara's life. It detailed all the available evidence and covered some of the local rumors and theories that swirled around Tara's disappearance. A tip came in with critical evidence. Brooke Sheridan had been dating her boyfriend, Bo Dukes, for about a year when she started noticing him behaving differently. It had been a sudden shift starting that summer. She described him as having panic attacks, talks of being suicidal, and general anxiety. On January 10th, he had a panic attack, and this time, Brooke had convinced him to tell her what was bothering him. What he said next shocked her. Tara Greenstead. Bo stated that two days after Tara had gone missing, during a massive search, his best friend Ryan Duke called him. Ryan stated he needed help and during that call, he confessed to murdering Tara Grinstead. Bo claimed that initially he thought Ryan had been joking, but then Ryan revealed he had dumped her body on Bo's grandfather's pecan farm. Ryan then brought him to where Tara's body was, and Bo said he freaked out and asked Ryan what according to Bo. Ryan stated that he'd been in Tara Grinstead's home looking for things to steal when she came back home. At the time, Ryan was dealing with a severe drug problem and he needed money. He said that when Tara came home, he was still inside and he attacked her and strangled her to death. Ryan also revealed he had borrowed Bo's truck to transport Tara's body. Both Ryan and Bo knew Tara. They had been students in her class. Bo claimed to have panicked and he didn't think anyone would have believed that he hadn't been involved in Tara's murder given the body was on his family's property and Ryan had used his truck. He stated that the two decided to burn Tara's body using firewood from the property and kept a bonfire going until they couldn't see any remains left and then they buried the rest and purposely started a wildfire in a nearby brush to explain the burn pit. Ryan Duke was arrested, but he claimed it had been Bo who had murdered Tara, and he helped Bo move her body, and had been Bo's idea to burn the body. Bo Dukes was also arrested on charges of concealing a death, evidence tampering, and hindering the apprehension of a criminal. 
Bo Dukes was able to post bond and later pleaded not guilty despite his earlier confession. Ryan Duke also pleaded not guilty. The two had separate trials, where he was found guilty of concealing Tara's death, as well as making false statements to law enforcement. He received 25 years in prison. Ryan Duke's trial was in May 2022. He faced murder and burglary charges, as well as aggravated assault charges. He was found not guilty on all charges, except he was found guilty on the concealment charge. He was given the maximum sentence of 10 years in prison. The two still face several civil suits. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. All right, let's dive back into the video. The missing person case of Lynette Dawson drew international attention in recent years with the 2018 release of The Teacher's Pet, a podcast that took a deep dive into the suspicious disappearance of an Australian woman in 1982. It was the flurry of media attention that, in part, changed this missing persons case into a murder conviction in August 2022. Lynette Dawson was a 33-year-old mother of two when she disappeared from her Sydney home in January 1982. For decades, investigators were not able to build enough of a case to charge anyone in relation to her disappearance or death. Her husband, Chris Dawson, maintained that she had called him one week after her disappearance and expressed that she needed time away. According to him, this call meant that Lynette must have left of her own accord to get away and start a new life. But her other family members, especially her daughters, mother, and siblings, were completely unconvinced that their mother would ever leave them on their own accord without any explanation and without ever returning. Then nearly 40 years later came the podcast The Teacher's Pet Listened to by Millions Around the World, uncovered new evidence and pointed to a few holes in the investigation as well as things investigators may have gotten wrong. Previous inquiries into her disappearance had concluded that she was killed by a known person. But according to that prosecutor, it was the podcast that finally produced enough evidence to lay charges. Chris Dawson, Lynette's husband, was charged with her murder in 2018. In 2022, he got his day in court. It was clear based on the evidence presented that Chris Dawson had been carrying on an extramarital affair with a former student and babysitter, who he had met as her teacher while working as a high school PE teacher, and that he killed his wife in order to be with the teen. That woman later testified against Dawson, saying that she had been groomed into a relationship with Dawson. She also said that her marriage with Dawson was emotionally and physically abusive and she escaped as soon as she could with her children. Further evidence showed what Chris Dawson was like behind closed doors. The prosecution dismissed Dawson's claims that his wife had called him after the date of her disappearance as made up. By Chris to confuse authorities and remove suspicion from him. There was no proof of the alleged phone call. On August 30th, 2022, the jury found Chris Dawson guilty of first-degree murder. His sentencing has been set for November 11th, 2022. Lynette Dawson's name has finally been cleared and justice has been delivered thanks to the power of a true crime podcast. But the trial still left Lynette's family with unanswered questions. How did he kill Lynette? Did anyone help him? And where was her body? After 40 years, it is unlikely that they'll be able to find her unless Chris reveals the information. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. So, in this case, there's a podcast called Serial that has brought forward new evidence. This evidence suggests that Adnan Syed, who was previously found guilty, might be innocent. During his trial, it was found that important information was kept from his defense team, which made the trial unfair. The story began on January 13, 1999, when Hyman Lee, an 18-year-old from Baltimore, Maryland, disappeared. She was supposed to pick up her cousin from daycare at 3.15 p.m. and then meet her wrestling team, which she helped coach, for their competition. However, she never showed up at either place. Her parents reported her missing that evening, and a search began immediately. The police talked to her friends, 
but no one had seen her since she left school around 2.15 p.m. They also contacted her current boyfriend and her ex-boyfriend, but neither had heard from her. At first, it was thought that Hay might have gone to California to visit her father, as she had been talking about that a lot recently. Hai came from an immigrant family from South Korea that had a modest, strict, and religious outlook on life, and one that stood out in stark contrast to her American friends. She had kept a lot of secrets from her family. She dated when she wasn't supposed to. She went to parties and wasn't always honest about where she was. But you could probably say that about most teenagers. But Hay was a good kid. She worked a part-time job, kept immaculate grades, had a tight group of friends that were also good kids. Hay was an athlete. She played lacrosse, coached wrestling, and was also in the school's ecology club, French club, and others. She was described as a leader whose happiness was infectious. She was always willing to lend a hand, and she had a heart of gold. She worked hard and always gave her best at everything she did. She wanted to become an optician and worked at lens crafters after school. Hai was extremely responsible, and it had been unusual for her to go anywhere without telling someone where she was going. Her disappearance had been extremely unusual. What had made her disappearance so confusing was that her car was also missing. Truly seemed as though she had just driven off. Weeks went by with little headway in the investigation into High's disappearance. Almost a month later, a body was discovered in Leakin Park, an area in Baltimore notorious for dumping bodies. The body was of a young woman, half buried in a shallow grave. The body was later identified as Heyman Lee. Her cause of death was determined to have been strangulation. There had been no evidence of sexual assault. She had been wearing the clothing she had last been seen in. Experts determined she had been murdered the day she went missing, shortly after she left school that day. After Hayes' body was discovered, the Baltimore City Police received an anonymous call to look into Jay Wilds. Detectives picked him up. He had a small criminal history of possession, but was friends with one of their lead suspects, Hayes' ex-boyfriend Adnan Syed. After a couple of interviews, Jay eventually confessed that he had first-hand knowledge that Adnan had killed Hay. He claimed that Adnan had told him he was going to murder Hayi in a jealous rage, and that Adnan had showed him Hayi's body in the trunk of his car. He said that he had blackmailed him into helping him dispose of Hayi's body in Lincoln Park. Adnan was arrested and maintained his innocence. He claimed that he hadn't seen Hayi after she left school that day. He said that he'd seen Jay that day because Jay had borrowed his car. Law enforcement used cell phone records to back up Jay's rendition of events, but that had evolved several times over the years. Adnan Syed was arrested and charged with Hay's murder on February 28, 1999. The following year Adnan went to trial. His lawyer, Cristina Gutierrez, represented him. Gutierrez was known as a good lawyer. However, she was dealing with several medical issues which may have impacted her performance as legal counsel. A key piece of information that could have changed the trial's outcome was a witness who had backed up Adnan's alibi for the time when law enforcement believed that Hay had been murdered. The witness had come forward herself, but had never been approached by Gutierrez or any other of the legal counsel for Adnan. Adnan was eventually convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison, 30 plus years for the murder of Heyman Lee, despite no concrete evidence connecting him to the crime. It had been Jay's confession that had sealed his fate with the jury. Jay had been given immunity for cooperation with the prosecution, and we know that the lead detectives on this case knew that Jay was a drug dealer because he admitted so in his confessions. But he was never charged with anything related to those crimes either. Anon was 17 years old when he first went to prison and spent 23 years there. He and Hay had dated on and off for two years, but the couple had broken up months before she disappeared. He had always claimed that they had both moved on by January. She was dating a co-worker and he was dating someone else. He had even met her new boyfriend, and he thought he was a nice guy. The two were still friends, and he'd always claimed that there was no animosity towards Hai. Hai's diaries appear to echo the same sentiments. They had seemed to be on good terms following the breakup. DNA evidence had been collected and tested, but the results were never brought up in the trial nor had the results been revealed to Adnan's counsel. Hai had tissue under her fingernails and it didn't belong to Adnan or Jay, but that had never been brought up during the trial. Also didn't belong to Adnan. 
A palm print had been found on Hay's car that did belong to him, but that wasn't unusual as Adnan had been in and out of Hay's car numerous times. But that palm print had been presented at court. The Serial Podcast began covering Hay's murder in 2014, focusing primarily on the person convicted, Adnan Syed. The podcast host, Sarah Koenig, had spent over a year studying the case and interviewing Adnan. Sarah had brought the case to the Innocence Project, who jumped in to take a deeper look at the evidence used to convict. It was the Innocence Project that was able to bring to light that the DNA evidence found on Hayes' body had never matched Adnan. On September 15, 2022, the Baltimore District Attorney brought forward a motion to vacate Adnan's conviction, citing Brady violations for prosecutors who originally worked on the case. A Brady violation is when the prosecution is determined to have purposely withheld evidence from the other side, meaning Adnan's legal team didn't get all of the evidence and therefore weren't able to effectively defend him. With Adnan's conviction being vacated, the courts basically said that his conviction didn't meet the legal threshold to uphold that conviction. Even if he had pleaded guilty, it still would have been dismissed. Adnan was released the day his conviction was vacated, and Baltimore City Police have stated that a suspect who had been previously known to the original investigation is now being looked into, but they are not announcing who that is at this time. Let me know if you want me to keep an eye on this case. While we still don't know exactly who killed Heyman Lee, had Serial not covered this case, we would never have known many details about this conviction that were so wrong. Everyone is entitled to a fair trial. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Before we continue, 90% of you haven't subscribed to our channel, so if you like this video, please subscribe. It motivates us to make more content for you. Okay, let's continue. On the night of March 5, 2022, police were called because of a house fire in the center of Luverden, the Frisian capital in the Netherlands. The fire was quickly extinguished, but officers found the body of a 21-year-old woman in one of the apartments above a tattoo parlor. She was stabbed multiple times with a sharp object. The woman was Mika Ort, an American student who was studying leisure and events management at NHL Stenden University of Applied Sciences. Mika was of Dutch heritage and was excited about her new life in the Netherlands. She had recently moved into the apartment, which was around 90 minutes away from Amsterdam, following a breakup with her boyfriend of two years. Mika had recently been matched with a new date on Tinder. He reportedly became quickly violent and started stalking her after she told him she didn't want to continue seeing him because she got back together with her ex. That Tinder date revealed to be 27-year-old Thomas R., who was caught by the German police a few hours after the murder. He was found in Leer, a small town across the Dutch borders. He was turned in by his parents, who alerted local police after he contacted them while fleeing, confessing to them what he'd done. They told law enforcement they were perplexed by their son's behavior and were left deeply shaken after receiving his call. Police reports showed that Thomas first threw an incendiary bomb at the apartment building. They suspected he started the fire to lure the residents out. A fight broke out in the stairwell between him and two male residents who were left mildly injured. He then climbed the stairs and attacked Mika in her apartment, stabbing her to death. In an interview with a Dutch newspaper, Michael, Mika's ex-boyfriend, said that they were thinking about rekindling their relationship, which he believed may have sent Thomas over the edge. He'd started stalking her and even installed a GPS tracker on her bicycle to keep tabs on her. He also harassed her by sending intimidating messages via WhatsApp. Thomas R. is now awaiting extradition to the Netherlands, where he will likely be charged with Mika Ort's murder. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. On the evening of December 13th, 2021, Chantel Smith and her son went to check on her 23-year-old daughter Lauren. Chantel was concerned because Lauren wasn't returning their calls or applying to texts, which was unusual. When they arrived at her apartment in Bridgeport, Connecticut, they found a strange note on the apartment door that said, if you're looking for Lauren, please contact this number. The number belonged to Lauren's landlord, who notified them of her death and gave them the number of the detective assigned to the case. Chantel was in shock and couldn't believe that she was learning of her daughter's death from the landlord. Lauren had died the night before, 
and law enforcement had never bothered to notify next of kin of her death. According to Chantel, her son spoke with the detective, and he mentioned that Lauren had been on a date the night of her death with an older man she met on Bumble, a dating app similar to Tinder. The detective told him that they didn't need to worry about him because he was a really nice guy. The really nice guy was a 37-year-old man named Matthew LaFontaine. He was the last person to see Lauren alive, yet he hasn't been named as a person of interest, nor was he taken into custody for questioning. In the police report, LaFontaine accounted that he recalled arriving at Lauren's apartment around 9.30 p.m. the night before. He said that the two had matched and bumbled three days prior and they'd been chatting. He claimed that Lauren had asked him for $40 to get her nails done and told him to meet her at her place with a bottle of tequila. LaFontaine proceeded to say that they drank tequila, played games, then had food together before starting to watch a movie. At one point, he said Lauren went to the bathroom to throw up, and in another, she went outside to get something from her brother. When she returned to the apartment, he said that she went directly to the bathroom and stayed there for 10 to 15 minutes, and when she came back, LaFontaine said that she fell asleep on the couch during the movie, and he carried her into the bedroom where he fell asleep next to her. He claimed that he woke up at 3 a.m. to use the washroom and heard her snoring. Then he woke again at 6.30 a.m. and saw blood dripping onto the bed, which was coming out of her nose. He checked her pulse and found she wasn't breathing, and that's when he called 911. The first responders to the scene wrote in the incident report that LaFontaine was frantic and visibly shaken. The weirdest part was that police never contacted the family, nor did they immediately examine the scene. No one in the Smithfield family was notified of her death until Chantel went to her daughter's apartment and was informed by the landlord. According to Lauren's brother, when he and his family walked into the apartment to gather Lauren's belongings, they found bottles of alcohol, flipped plates of food, a blood-stained sheet, a sedative pill, and a used condom. According to the Smithfield's family lawyer, Darnell Clausland, no evidence has been submitted to the forensic lab said that the family was planning to sue the city for failing to investigate Lauren's death properly. On January 21, 2022, the family lawyer issued a notice of claim announcing that they intended to sue the Bridgeport Police Department for its poor handling of the case. They believed the police department was racially insensitive as they didn't take Lauren's death seriously. On January 23rd, which would have been Lauren's 24th birthday, activists and community members joined Lauren's family in a march outside the Bridgeport Police Department, where they demanded justice for the young woman. On January 24th, the autopsy results were publicly revealed. The medical examiner concluded that Lauren had died of acute intoxication due to the combined effects of fentanyl, promethazine, hydroxine, and alcohol. Her death was ruled an accident. Crossland, the family lawyer, commented that the toxicology report made her death look even more like a murder. Her family and friends said that Lauren didn't do drugs, rarely drank, and regularly went to the gym and took care of herself. Her family believes that she was drugged and assaulted and died from a lethal combination of drugs. After that, the city's mayor, Joe Gannam, announced that the Office of Internal Affairs would conduct a full and fair investigation into how the police handled Lauren's death. Six weeks after Lauren's death, after a growing outcry to properly investigate the case, Bridgeport Police said that its Narcotics and Vice Division, along with the DEA, were finally going to investigate if any crimes were committed. Additionally, there have been reports that LaFontaine may have had a personal connection with one of the lead detectives. It was reported that a detective arrived at 3.30 a.m. prior to the 911 call and there are allegations that this detective may have assisted in covering up what happened to Lauren. That detective was subsequently investigated by Eternal Affairs and suspended. Another detective was also suspended pending the results of an internal investigation. They were suspended in January 2022, and as of this recording, there hasn't been an update on this case. But let me know if you want me to follow it. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. In April 2021, an 18-year-old named Issa Maiman Atut, who was a student athlete at Virginia Tech University, was using Tinder. He matched with a 21-year-old woman named Angie Renee, and they decided to meet at Angie's apartment on April 10th for some private time together. Issa felt something was off when he got to the apartment, 
It was dark, and Angie wouldn't show her face, but they still went ahead with their plans. A few weeks later, one of Issa's teammates mentioned that he had also matched with Angie on Tinder. Angie had told him that she had met Issa. This raised suspicions that Angie might not be who she claimed to be on the app. To investigate, Issa and his teammate decided to set up another date with Angie to try and figure out her true identity. And he went with two other friends to her apartment on May 31st. His friends waited outside while Issa Maimon went inside with Angie. Similar to the first time he went to the apartment, it was dark and Angie was wearing a hoodie and sweatpants. Again, he couldn't see her face. According to him, he confronted Angie and discovered Angie was a middle-aged man. During the confrontation, the two began scuffling and Issa Maimon stated that during the fight, the other man began reaching between his mattress. And he assumed that he was going for a firearm. He then started to punch the man in the face multiple times and ran out of the apartment. The man was discovered the following day by his brother and was later identified as 40-year-old Jerry Smith. He had severe blunt force trauma and had died from injuries sustained in the beating. Smith had been using photographs he found online to meet young men for months. The real Angie Wren was an ER physician and also a graduate of Virginia Tech and she had no idea her photo was being used on Tinder. It didn't take long for law enforcement to track down Ice MMM and his friends. He had been very open with law enforcement about what had happened. At the time he was being interviewed, he didn't know Smith had died and had assumed the man was pressing assault charges against him. He told the police officer he felt violated and said in the interview, quote, I was in shock in disbelief that someone had tricked me and lied to me. He told law enforcement that he'd been scared and didn't know why this person had lied or what their motive was behind luring him into his apartment. And when he thought he was going for a weapon, he panicked. He felt he was in the fight of his life. Police later determined that there was a weapon between the mattresses, though not a firearm, there was a knife. Isaman was later arrested and charged with murder and pleaded not guilty. He faced 40 years in prison if convicted, and the trial began May 25, 2022. It was a relatively short trial, only three days. I remember during trial he seemed remorseful for his actions, and his statements of events that took place at night never really changed or shifted. And his lawyer kept with the defense that he'd been lured into the apartment under false pretenses. And when he discovered that Angie was not the person he thought they were, he panicked. When he thought that this person, who was ultimately not who they said they were, was potentially reaching for what he believed was a weapon. He fought for his life. The prosecution claimed that Issa Maimon went to the apartment for the purpose of attacking Smith. They stated that the beating Smith received was well in excess of what he would have needed to get out of the apartment and if he felt he was under threat, why hadn't he called the police? Issa Maimon had stated that Smith had been alive when he left the apartment, which was confirmed by forensic evidence. Though they couldn't determine exactly when he had died, there was blood spatter evidence that showed he was breathing after the attack. His defense team hammered that Isaman was 18, that he'd never been in trouble before, didn't have a history of violence, and was a victim of sexual assault. Reluctant to call the police likely stemmed from where he grew up in Norfolk, Virginia, where he'd experienced seeing a lot of crime. He told a story on the stand of his grandparents experiencing two violent robberies, and saying that they started sleeping with firearms nearby, and many people he knew kept weapons near their beds. The jury deliberated for three hours before coming to a verdict of not guilty. Issa Maimon was released following the verdict. After his initial arrest, he was held in jail pending the trial results. He had been suspended from school and from the football team he played for. His lawyer made a statement to the media following his release, quote, and trying to see what he can do to get re-enrolled in university and hopefully be able to pursue college football, which he loves so much. This was a complicated case, and before we end the video, I just want to add some things. While Jerry Smith's death was initially investigated as a hate crime, there was no evidence to suggest that he was trans or identified as a woman. There was no evidence that this was a hate crime. Jerry appeared to be very purposely misrepresenting himself. As a woman, in order to have sexual relations with people who didn't know he was a middle-aged man, which is sexual assault. From what we know of this case, Smith was a serial predator of young men. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. In 2001, Dr. Don C. 
Wiley was known as one of the top structural biologists worldwide. He held the prestigious position of John Jay, Loeb Professor of Biochemistry and Biophysics at Harvard University. Throughout his career, he made significant discoveries through his research. According to Ian A. Wilson, who worked with Dr. Wiley as his first postdoctoral fellow in 1977, each of Dr. Wiley's accomplishments would have been considered remarkable for any scientist's entire career. Dr. Wiley received numerous prestigious awards, such as the Japan Prize and the Albert Lasker Medical Research Award. Although his work delved into complex scientific areas, mainly focusing on the structures of viruses and proteins within the human immune system, its impact extended across various fields including cell biology, immunology, virology, and biochemistry, as noted by others in his field. Additionally, Dr. Wiley contributed his expertise to the Scientific Advisory Board of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. He regularly attended meetings of this advisory board, further highlighting his commitment to advancing scientific knowledge and its application in medical research and treatment. In addition to helping the hospital, this trip had personal benefits for Dr. Wiley as well. Dr. Wiley had been born in Ohio, but both his father and brother had moved to the greater Memphis area. So Dr. Wiley's family would join him in Memphis from their home in Massachusetts at the end of the annual meeting to spend time with the family. Dr. Wiley attended a dinner to mark the end of the advisory board's annual meeting at the historic Peabody Hotel. After dinner, Dr. Wiley went to the hotel bar to continue socializing and listen to a pianist playing in the hotel lobby. According to the bartender, Dr. Wiley ordered two drinks while he was there, but then switched to sparkling water. Dr. Wiley told the bartender that he was switching to a non-alcoholic drink because he would be driving back to his father's home, where he had been staying. At the end of the night, the precise time Dr. Wiley left the Peabody that night is not known, but it was sometime around midnight on November 16th. At 3.47 a.m. that morning, a trucker called 911. There was a car blocking traffic on the Hernando de Soto Bridge, which carries Interstate 40, over the Mississippi River and connects Memphis, Tennessee with West Memphis, Arkansas. For more calls, reporting the car would come in the next 15 minutes. There is no real shoulder on the bridge, so the stopped car was blocking a lane and posing a safety hazard. When police arrived on the scene, they discovered a white 2001 Mitsubishi Gallant with a full tank of gas. Its keys still in the ignition and no driver to be found. It was missing its right passenger side hubcap and it had streaks of yellow paint on the rear driver's side bumper. Police estimated that the car could only have been on the bridge for 15 minutes at most. Given the fact that it was disrupting traffic and quickly generated numerous 911 calls, even at 4 o'clock in the morning, the Hernando de Soto Bridge is still heavily traveled. The city of Memphis is a major logistics hub. It is home of the world headquarters of FedEx and one of the largest cargo airports in the United States. The city also has five Class 1 railroads and a port on the Mississippi River. Freight is continuously coming in and out of the city. There may not have been commuter traffic on the bridge at 4 in the morning, but there would certainly have been plenty of trucks using it to come and go from Memphis. The Gallant had misery plates, and police soon learned that it was part of the Avis rental car fleet. It had been signed out at the Memphis International Airport to Dr. Don Wiley of Cambridge, Massachusetts. When Dr. Wiley's wife received the phone call informing her that her husband's car had been found abandoned, she was already at Logan International Airport with her two children, waiting to board a plane to Memphis. Dr. Wiley had been married twice and had a total of four children, two from each marriage. His current wife, Katrin Valgis' daughter, was flying into Memphis with their two children, ages 10 and 7, to spend time with Dr. Wiley's family as was the family's custom after Dr. Wiley finished his meeting of the Scientific Advisory Board. Dr. Wiley was supposed to pick his family up at the airport that day, and they had plans to visit Graceland. Dr. Wiley's case was initially treated as a missing persons case. The detectives assigned to it feared that Dr. Wiley had jumped off the Hernando de Soto Bridge. Those who knew Dr. Wiley were quick to dismiss this theory. Dr. Wiley's brother Greg called the theory completely inconceivable. Witnesses who had been at the dinner on the 15th said that Dr. Wiley had been happily talking about long-term plans, like the trip he was taking to his wife's native Iceland over Christmas, as well as short-term plans, like the jog he was going to take in the morning. That evening, 
Dr. Wiley had no marital or financial problems or any history of mental health problems. The river was searched, but nothing was found. When Dr. Wiley's body was not found in the river below the bridge, his case was transferred from the Missing Persons Department to the Homicide Bureau. The case was transferred on November 20th. It had rained heavily in Memphis on November 19th, eliminating any potential forensic evidence that may have been left on the bridge by the time the Homicide Bureau opened its investigation. The missing hubcap from Dr. Wiley's rental car was never found. There was yellow paint on several construction signs near the bridge, but no damage corresponding to that on the car's bumper was found on any of the structures in the area. Both of these facts indicated that the car may not have received the damage it had sustained in the immediate area of the bridge. Five weeks after Dr. Wiley was last seen, on December 20, 2001, a crane operator at the Murray Hydroelectric plant was pulling logs out of the Mississippi River. The plant was located outside of Vidalia, Louisiana, more than 300 miles downriver from Memphis. The crane operator suddenly noticed a body in the river amongst the logs. The Concordia Parish Sheriff's Office was called and investigators went out on a boat to retrieve the body. The body was still covered by clothes. And in one of the pockets was a wallet containing Dr. Wiley's identification, credit cards, and some cash. Unaware of Dr. Wiley's disappearance out of Memphis, the Sheriff's Office first called police in Cambridge, Massachusetts, based on the address on the identification. They also contacted the FBI office in New Orleans, who knew to get in contact with the authorities in Memphis. The body was transported back to Memphis to be positively identified and autopsied. Using dental records, the body was quickly confirmed to be Dr. Wiley. The identification was made public on December 22nd, two days after his body was discovered. Dr. Wiley had just turned 57 a month before his death. The autopsy and investigation by the medical examiner's office would take several weeks to complete. On January 14, 2002, Shelby County Medical Examiner, Dr. O.C. to announce his findings in Dr. Wiley's case. Dr. Smith ruled that Dr. Wiley had died following an accidental fall from the Hernando de Soto Bridge. Dr. Smith acknowledged that there was no way to definitively say what brought Dr. Wiley to the bridge that night or what exactly happened once he got there. Based on the autopsy and his examination of the bridge, however, Dr. Smith put forth a hypothesis that a physically impaired Dr. Wiley had been in two minor mishaps while driving, one of which damaged the back of the car and the other that took off the front hubcap. Dr. Wiley then stopped the car on the bridge to inspect the damage, even though it was minor. He stepped up onto the curb and was then blown over the railing of the bridge, potentially from a gust of wind, coming off a passing 18-wheeler. The curb on the bridge was only eight inches wide. Dr. Wiley would have needed to stand on it to avoid being hit by oncoming cars, as there is no real shoulder on the bridge. He would have had to be standing close to the railing because the curb was so narrow. The railing only rose 43 inches above the roadway, and the curb was 10 inches tall. Based on Dr. Smith's measurements, when the 6 feet 3 inches Dr. Wiley was standing up on the curb, the top of the railing would have only hit him mid-thigh, approximately a foot below his center of gravity, making it possible for him to have fallen over it. Dr. Smith outright rejected the possibility that Dr. Wiley had jumped off of the bridge, in part due to the lack of indicators and stressors in his life. Physical indicators from Dr. Wiley's autopsy supported this assertion as well. Dr. Wiley's body had numerous fractures, but there were more on his right side than on his left, 22 versus 15, and they were in a pattern that indicated that Dr. Wiley had hit the water with his right side, which would be more consistent with an accidental fall, than with an intentional jump with the feet going first. Dr. Wiley's autopsy was also inconsistent with those of other individuals who had jumped off the same bridge. In the previous autopsies, he had performed on some of those individuals. Dr. Smith noted that they had all cleared a box beam 12 feet below the roadway, that stuck out 38 inches beyond the main structure of the bridge, presumably due to the force of jumping. Dr. Wiley's breastbone was cracked at the spot that would have been right under the third button of his dress shirt. When Dr. Wiley's body was found, the third button from his dress shirt was missing, but the stitching that had held it on was perfectly intact. To Dr. Smith, this indicated that it had been broken off rather than ripped off. 
He believed that Dr. Wiley's chest hit the box beam during his fall, which would mean that he did not have the force of a jump behind him. Dr. Smith estimated that Dr. Wiley's 135-foot fall from the bridge to the waters of the Mississippi River took 2.9 seconds. He hit the water with his right side at a speed of roughly 60 miles per hour. He died upon impact, rather than from drowning. Dr. Smith made a major revelation at the press conference that greatly changed the context of Dr. Wiley's disappearance. Dr. Wiley had apparently suffered from what Dr. Smith described as an infrequent and poorly understood seizure disorder for several years. Dr. Wiley kept this disorder private with only his immediate family and a small circle of friends knowing about it. He did not ever receive any medical treatment for this condition and tried to manage it himself. He had no formal diagnosis of this condition and took no medication to control it. With the mild episodes being more controllable, but the severe ones impacting Dr. Wiley's ability to drive. Dr. Wiley's widow has chosen to protect his privacy and not publicly speak about his condition. As such, the only information we have about this disorder comes from Dr. Smith, who learned about it from Dr. Wiley's wife and spoke about it both at this press conference and in future press interviews. We do not have specific information about what these episodes entailed or what specific kind of seizures Dr. Wiley had. According to Dr. Smith, the episodes did seem to be brought on by alcohol, lack of sleep, or stress. Dr. Smith believed that all three of these variables could have contributed to Dr. Wiley's death. The toxicology report had not been completed at the time of the initial press conference, but Dr. Smith announced there that alcohol has been identified at levels suggesting impairment in the samples from the autopsy, so other tissues had to be used for testing. A sample taken from Dr. Wiley's chest cavity showed an alcohol level of 0.17%. If this had been Dr. Wiley's blood alcohol content when he was still alive, he would have been heavily intoxicated. However, alcohol levels tend to rise in the body after death due to fermentation and diffusion. According to Dr. Smith, this process makes it impossible to say exactly how much alcohol was in Dr. Wiley's system at the time of his death. I would defy any expert who would come up with a solid number that would adequately define what his true blood alcohol was at the time of the mishap, Dr. Smith said at the press conference. Based on Dr. Smith's findings and the lack of any physical evidence indicating foul play, the Memphis Police Department officially closed Dr. Wiley's case. Dr. Wiley's case was perplexing from the very beginning when his rental car was found on the Hernando de Soto Bridge. The fact that Dr. Wiley's car was found on the bridge was concerning not just because it was found on a bridge and because it was obstructing traffic, but because there is no reason for him to have been traveling in that direction. Not all of the reports on this case agree where Dr. Wiley's father's house was located, but the general consensus is that it was in the suburb of Germantown. One report puts it north of Memphis, and a few say it was in East Memphis. The unifying detail in all of these accounts is that Dr. Wiley had an approximately 20-minute drive to reach the house. It is not necessarily important which of these locations is accurate. The important thing to note is that they are all not in the direction Dr. Wiley was driving. East Memphis and Germantown are both east of the Peabody, and north of Memphis obviously means north of the Peabody. Dr. Wiley's car was found west of where he was last seen. No one has a solid explanation as to why Dr. Wiley was driving into Arkansas. Memphis Health Department spokesperson Brenda Ward has posited that Dr. Wiley may have intended to get on I-40 East and simply got on I-40 West by mistake. It is an easy error to make, she argued, for someone who is not familiar with the area and would be confused by all of the construction that had been going on at the bridge at the time. The problem with this explanation is that Dr. Wiley was familiar with the area. He visited Memphis frequently to see his family and was in that exact area of town at least once every year for the advisory board meeting, if not at other times during his trips to town. Dr. Wiley had been in Memphis just a month before his trip there in November 2001. Furthermore, this construction had been going on since the year before. An ongoing seismic retrofitting project began on the bridge in 2000. The bridge is within close proximity of the new Madrid seismic zone and is being retrofitted to be able to withstand a 7.7 magnitude earthquake. The construction would not have been a surprise to someone who frequently visited the city, like Dr. Wiley. The most glaring mystery in this case is the missing time between when Dr. Wiley left the Peabody 
and when his car was found on the bridge. As previously stated, the car could not have been on the bridge very long before it was reported to police because it was blocking traffic in a highly traveled area. The entrance to the Hernando de Soto Bridge is only five minutes away from the Peabody Hotel. In addition, the records from the rental car agency showed that the car had not been driven any more miles than the police could account for. If Dr. Wiley left the immediate area of the Peabody before driving to the bridge, it was either on foot or in a different vehicle. Given the fact that Dr. Wiley was an accomplished biologist with detailed knowledge about how and he went missing during the fall of 2001, there were initial fears that he may have been abducted by individuals who wanted to use his extensive knowledge for nefarious purposes. The FBI took an early interest in the case, although they were never formally investigating Dr. Wiley's disappearance. According to William Warner, head of the FBI office in Memphis, the state of affairs in the United States at the time required them to entertain this possibility, even though it seemed remote. Dr. Wiley would not have been a good person to abduct for such purposes. While he studied viruses, he did not have access to samples of dangerous viruses or have the knowledge to grow them, as he only studied their component parts. I do not believe that this theory plays any part in this case. To be fair to the people who still hold this theory though, his abductors would not necessarily have understood that Dr. Wiley lacked this knowledge. A Harvard professor who had won numerous awards for studying dangerous viruses would probably sound like someone who knew how to grow viruses to the average person without a scientific background. My main problem with this theory is that I do not believe that Dr. Wiley would have ever been released by his abductors if the scenario occurred. I also believe that the physical evidence indicates that he did fall from the bridge. Since he was alive when he went over the railing, his abductors would have had to drug him with something that would not show up on the toxicology report and then hoist him over the railing. While Dr. Wiley could have fallen accidentally within a few seconds of stopping his car, it would have taken multiple people, a few minutes, and an additional vehicle to get an unconscious six feet three inches Dr. Wiley over the railing. It is hard to imagine that none of the truck drivers passing by on the bridge would have seen this. The same problem arises if Dr. Wiley had been knocked over the railing. While fighting off his abductors, the altercation would most likely have been witnessed by a passing driver. Furthermore, the force of a push off the bridge may have caused Dr. Wiley to clear the box beam under the bridge on his way down to the river. Overall, I am accepting of the conclusion that Dr. Wiley died in an accidental fall. However, I still question how exactly he got to the bridge and what happened in the four hours prior to the fall. I also have concerns with some of the conclusions Dr. Smith arrived at, or at least believe that they add new layers to the mystery rather than take them away, if they are correct. While I agree with Dr. Smith that we will probably never know exactly what happened to Dr. Wiley in the moments leading up to his death, I do have some concerns about some of the conclusions he reached. I am most concerned by Dr. Smith's assertion that Dr. Wiley had enough alcohol in his system to be impaired at the time of his death. We know, based on eyewitness testimony, that Dr. Wiley consumed alcohol on the night of November 15th. However, we also know based on this testimony that he did not drink to excess or become visibly intoxicated. He also switched to a non-alcoholic drink before leaving the hotel to allow some time for his body to process the alcohol he had consumed before he began driving. At this point, I have to make some assumptions to fill in some details and make my own calculations, which I want to make very clear could very well be faulty and are decidedly not exact. To estimate Dr. Wiley's level of intoxication on the night of November 15th, I am believing the bartender's report that Dr. Wiley had two alcoholic drinks and that he was in a good mood but not overly intoxicated. I am placing his final drink before switching to something non-alcoholic one hour before he left the Peabody, which would make it at 11 p.m. I do not know the exact amount of food and wine Dr. Wiley consumed at the banquet earlier in the evening, which is a major variable to have missing. Dr. Wiley's weight has not been publicly revealed, but he was six feet three inches, he appears to have a slight build in most of the publicly available pictures of him, so for my calculations, I am assigning him a weight of 160 pounds, which is on the lower end of the healthy weight range for a man of that height, according to the National Institutes of Health. There are a wide variety of factors that impact blood alcohol content, but based on the information we have, I am estimating that Dr. Wiley's blood alcohol content when he left the Peabody around midnight would be 0.05, the approximate value provided on this chart. 
this level would make him impaired but not legally intoxicated. If this number is correct and Dr. Wiley's BAC dropped at the approximate standard hourly rate, his BAC would have been back to zero by 3.47 a.m. when his car was discovered on the bridge. Based on Dr. Smith's statement that alcohol levels go up in a person's body after they die, it makes sense that alcohol will be detected in his system at his autopsy. I do not know how much longer alcohol remains in tissue rather than in the blood, so there could have been a fair amount of alcohol left in Dr. Wiley's body. However, given the amount of time it took to find Dr. Wiley's body, even a small amount of alcohol left in his tissues would have had time to ferment and show up in the larger amount found at the time of his autopsy. Dr. Smith, however, was convinced that the levels found during the autopsy were high enough to have caused impairment in Dr. Wiley at the time of his death. By his own admission, though, there is no way to know for sure exactly how much alcohol he had in his system at the time. It seems unlikely, then, that Dr. Smith can be certain that Dr. Wiley was impaired by alcohol at the time of his death. Based solely on Dr. Smith's own statements at the press conference, I am inclined to believe that Dr. Smith overstepped in making this assumption. I do not have a medical background, however, so I cannot completely discount the possibility that Dr. Wiley did have enough alcohol in his system to impair his behavior. If this is true, it opens up two main possibilities. Either Dr. Wiley died closer to the time he left the Peabody, or he went somewhere else and consumed more alcohol. After he left the hotel, given the amount of time that had passed between when Dr. Wiley died and when his body was found, his exact time of death cannot be determined. So he theoretically could have died closer to midnight, rather than 4 a.m. However, this would mean that someone else staged the scene on the bridge several hours after Dr. Wiley fell. As again, we know that the car was not on the bridge until closer to 4 a.m. Someone who was not responsible for Dr. Wiley's death, but was aware of it somehow, could have staged the scene with his rental car. But that begs the question of why, and of how they had his rental car. It would not have been impossible for Dr. Wiley to walk less than the mile from the Peabody to the bridge, and then fall from it. Someone else then theoretically could have driven the rental car to the bridge to ensure that Dr. Wiley's fall was discovered. But what would their motive be to bring attention to the accident, but not report it? How would they have gotten the car key? And most importantly, how would they have known that Dr. Wiley fell from the bridge? The only real scenario in which this works will be if someone from the conference took Dr. Wiley's keys from him because they thought he was too intoxicated to drive, and Dr. Wiley then took off on foot. He then began walking across the bridge to Arkansas and fell off of it. There would be no way for the people back at the hotel to know that Dr. Wiley fell off the bridge, however. Even if they did somehow learn that it had happened, it is curious that they wanted the accident to be discovered enough that they drove the car to the bridge, but not enough that they simply reported it to police. The possibility that Dr. Wiley made a stop on his way back to his father's house and consumed additional alcohol closer to 4 a.m. seems a lot more likely. However, no witnesses have ever come forward to say that they met with Dr. Wiley that night or that they saw him at a bar or liquor store. Dr. Wiley was not known to have a problem with alcohol, so it seems unlikely that he would stop for another drink, just for the sake of having another drink. If he did make another unknown stop that last night, it would most likely be because he was meeting with someone. Dr. Wiley had a full day with his wife and youngest children planned on August 16th, which makes me wonder what could have been so important to Dr. Wiley that he would be willing to stay out until 4 a.m., knowing he had a full day of commitments ahead of him. We know that Dr. Wiley because of the mileage on his rental car. Furthermore, if he had enough alcohol in his system to physically impair him and cause him to have two minor traffic incidents as he got onto the bridge, as Dr. Smith has asserted, his driving would probably have been erratic. He would have been incredibly lucky if he did not pass a police officer during these four hours, especially in the area of town he was in. If Dr. Wiley had been on foot, he still would probably have attracted notice, either because of his impaired behavior or his formal dress. Still in his clothes from the banquet, he was decidedly overdressed for the bar and nightlife scene he was so close to. No witnesses came forward with a report of a lone man in a fancy suit when police were appealing for information while Dr. Wiley was missing. Dr. Wiley's unspecified seizure disorder could have played a role in this missing period of time. While many people are only familiar with tonic-clonic or grand mal seizures, in which the affected individual shakes uncontrollably and loses consciousness, 
there are in fact quite a wide variety of different types of seizures. Other types of seizures can cause muscle weakness, muscle stiffness, uncontrollable tics, and the experiencing of sounds and smells that are not real. In absent seizures, the patient cannot respond or react for several seconds, often staring blankly into space and not remembering the experience. Seizures are complicated and can have drastic and complex effects on human behavior. Some types of seizures could explain why Dr. Wiley fell off the bridge, since a sudden change in his muscle tone while he was standing near the railing could have sent him over it. Other types of seizures, or perhaps their aftermath, could explain why he was unaccounted for almost four hours. He may have been left disoriented following a type of seizure that impacted his level of consciousness, but not necessarily his motor function. Without specific information about what happened to Dr. Wiley during his episodes, it is hard to say what impact they could have had on the final hours of his life. It is easier to imagine how they could have impacted his final few minutes. Perhaps Dr. Wiley could feel a major episode coming on, possibly clued in by the fact that he was driving somewhere he shouldn't be, away from his father's home. This would be almost the only reason why stopping the car in the middle of the busy road would have actually been a smart move. An unnamed friend of Dr. Wiley's hypothesized, to Doug Most of Boston Magazine, that Dr. Wiley may have gone over to the railing to vomit. Nausea can be a side effect of certain types of seizures. Personally, this scenario seems like the most logical account of the doctor's final moments. However, it does not answer all of the questions that linger in this case. Even if we accept Dr. Wiley's death as the simple yet unusual accident that it appears to be, the missing four hours remain a mystery, and that mystery still bothers me. Again, I don't believe that there was necessarily foul play involved in this case, or that Dr. Wiley was held and interrogated for his knowledge of the structure of viruses by individuals with evil intentions during those four hours. I do, however, believe that there is a missing piece of this story. There are multiple plausible explanations for why Dr. Wiley fell from the Hernando de Soto Bridge. But there are almost no plausible explanations for what happened during those missing four hours, based on the information we currently have. While Dr. Smith is correct in that there is no way for us to find out if it was alcohol, a seizure, or a passing truck that sent Dr. Wiley over the railing of the bridge, it seems conceivable that we could one day find out where Dr. Wiley was during that elusive missing time. This is not to suggest that the police in Memphis did not adequately investigate where Dr. Wiley was during this time. They seem to have done all they could, publicly appealing for witnesses, investigating the mileage on the car, and collecting and reviewing surveillance footage. If we ever do get more information about where Dr. Wiley went after leaving the Peabody, it will most likely be the result of a new witness coming forward. Dr. Wiley spent his life investigating life below even its cellular level, solving mysteries and benefiting the scientific and medical communities. His death, however, created large, lingering mysteries, in addition to the pain his loss caused his family and friends. Hopefully one day, a different kind of investigator will be able to answer these final, nagging concerns about Dr. Wiley's final hours. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. On April 19, 1991, everything seemed normal for the Hibbs family. 12-year-old David Hibbs left school early and started walking home in Croydon, Pennsylvania. But when he got close to his house, something seemed off. The windows were dark, and he saw smoke coming from the kitchen. When he opened the back door, he was met with flames. His mom, Joy Hibbs, was inside, and he tried to find help, but it was too late. Sadly, Joy was found dead in the wreckage of their home. Surprisingly, she wasn't killed by the fire's smoke, but rather by being stabbed multiple times, having marks on her neck from being tied up, and having broken ribs. It was a terrible crime Joy had been murdered, and her body was found in her son's room. The fire marshal noted that accelerant had been used in each of the bedrooms and had likely had been set shortly before David's discovery. As school didn't normally end at noon, the killer likely thought they had more time, and the fire would fully engulf the home before it was discovered by neighbors. No one could understand why the suburban mother of two had been targeted in such a horrific attack. However, Joy's daughter revealed that someone had slashed her tires days before her murder, 
and Joy's co-workers stated that a man had called her at work several times threatening her. Several people were interviewed, including Joy's husband, but all were released. Earlier that morning, Joy had gone to the bank, cashed her paycheck, and she'd gone grocery shopping, which was a part of her normal Friday routine. And she was later seen that morning walking the new family puppy major. Her wallet was found wedged between the couch cushions empty, and the contents of her purse had been found strewn around the kitchen. For 31 years, the Hibbs family were left with questions unanswered. In January 2022, the case was transferred to the Bucks County Sheriff's Office to be reinvestigated. Previous witnesses were reinterviewed, and in doing so, they received new testimony from a witness who had been withholding key information. April Atkins was married to Robert Atkins back in the 90s, but the couple had since divorced, and she felt that she needed to do the right thing now. They lived two doors down from the Hibs, and she testified that on April 19, 1991, Robert had come home that afternoon covered in blood. He had told her that he had stabbed someone and demanded that she gather up the children because they were going to the Poconos for the weekend. She said at the time Atkins had been a low-level drug dealer. He was also working with law enforcement as an informant. He had several arrests related to drug possession, but he'd never been charged. She said that their alibi had been checked by police investigating at the time, and though Robert had been a suspect, he was released. She said that she never came forward out of fear of her ex-husband, and when they divorced, she couldn't come forward because he had custody of their youngest child, and she feared for their safety. Now that all her children were adults, she felt it was safe to come forward. Robert had a second woman provide him with an alibi for the time Joy had been murdered. He had made her sign a paper stating that she'd been on the phone with him, but when law enforcement went to speak with her, she had stated that it had been a lie. Through April Atkins, they attempted to get a confession from Robert. They had April call him and tell him that detectives had come to her home and interviewed her about their alibis. Robert told her during that call that she needed to invoke her Fifth Amendment rights and not say anything to them. He even said, the phone is probably being tapped right now. Law enforcement arrested Robert Atkins on May 25, 2022, and he had his first court date on September 21, 2022, where he was charged with first-degree murder, second-degree murder, arson, and robbery. Robert Atkins has pleaded not guilty. This case appears to be going to trial, however, further court dates have not been set yet. Atkins, if convicted, faces life in prison or the death penalty. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. It was on January 21st, 1982 in Seaside, California, when five-year-old and fam convinced her mother to allow her to walk to her afternoon kindergarten class alone. The youngest of 10 siblings, little and wanted to be like her siblings and not have her mother walk with her. The school was only three blocks away. With great hesitation, Anne's mother let her walk to school and watch from the window as Anne strode off. It should have only taken her a few minutes to get to school, but after Anne ran to the corner, something happened and she never made it to school. A massive search for the child was undertaken and two days later, the body was found two miles away. She'd been strangled and assaulted. During the murder investigation, detectives at the time had little to go on. No one had seen and walking or getting abducted. There were no suspects and quickly the leads dried up. The case went cold and sat for four decades untouched. In 2020, the Montgomery County District Attorney opened a new cold case unit, and Anne's case was reopened. Detectives submitted all evidence for new advanced DNA testing, and they discovered a hair sample in Anne's clothing. In 2022, they had enough DNA to submit to the national database and immediately got a hit from a previously convicted man. Currently in Hueso County Jail in Nevada on a parole violation, Robert Leno had previously served a 20-year sentence for lewdness with a minor and possession of inappropriate imagery of minors. Now 70 years old, Leno had been 29 when and was kidnapped. He had lived nearby the Pham family and had never been a suspect in the initial investigation. Before his arrest in 1998, he had been stationed at Fort Ord, a now-closed army base. Anne's body had been found in a wooded area near that base. He is currently awaiting extradition to California. He was charged with first-degree murder with special circumstances. 
he faces life in prison or potentially the death penalty. Anne's family hasn't made any statements to the media, but they are said to be processing this new information as they never believe they would have answers to Anne's murder. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. It was a warm summer evening on June 29th, 1986 in Salem, Massachusetts. Claire Gravel was celebrating with her softball team at McGlish's Pub. The 20-year-old student was studying computer science at Salem State College. After a few drinks with friends, one of her friends dropped her off at her apartment around 1.30 a.m. After that, little is known about what happened to Claire. The following afternoon, a body was found in Beverly, Massachusetts, only a few miles from Salem. It was a young woman that had been severely beaten and strangled to death. The young woman was later identified as Claire. Law enforcement had little to work with. No one knew of anyone who had wanted to harm Claire. The friend that had dropped her off stated that they didn't see Claire go into her apartment as it was too dark, and stated that she might have been kidnapped on her way in. No one knew of her dating anyone or having any issues with a stalker. None of her neighbors heard anything suspicious or remembered seeing anything out of the ordinary, but many were asleep by that time. Eventually, the case went cold, where it stayed for nearly four decades. In 2012, Claire's case was reopened by cold case detectives, and evidence from the initial investigation were retested for DNA. In 2022, the results of that retesting were made public when an Essex County grand jury indicted 62-year-old John Carey. Carey was already incarcerated at MCI Concord on a 2008 conviction for attempted murder. In 2007, Carey went over to a neighbor's house where Rosemary Diskin was home. Carey stated that he was meeting her husband for a drink, but when she revealed he wasn't home, Carey attacked her. He had brought a tie with him and attempted to strangle her with it. However, Carey didn't know that her 12-year-old son was home at the time, and he attacked her Carrie with a knife from the kitchen and stabbed him in the back, allowing the two to get away and seek help. Rosemary was certain that had her son not intervened, Carrie had intended to kill her. Carrie later revealed to law enforcement that he found asphyxiation erotic and claimed that the encounter was consensual, a claim that Rosemary stated was a way to re-victimize her by having the people around her think that she was having an affair with her neighbor. During the investigation, Law enforcement discovered Carrie's computer, which was filled with images and video clips of women being strangled. Ultimately, a jury found Carrie guilty of attempted murder and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Carrie had been due for early release on good behavior. Rosemary had recently been alerted to his release and was grateful that this new indictment had prevented him from being let out of prison, as she had been scared that he would come after her again if he got out. More will be released on what evidence the state has against Carrie in regard to the murder of Claire Gravel, and it will be revealed in further court proceedings. At this time, there are no updates on when his next day in court will be. Claire Gravel's family, her father and siblings, said in a statement to the media that they are relieved and very, very grateful that a suspect has been identified. After so many years, what do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. In June 2022, an arrest was made closing two cold cases in California. 76-year-old James Ray Gary was identified in a sexual assault case in 2021. Evidence from that case had been submitted to the state's database and hit matches on two cold cases. The first was from the 1980 murder of Latrell Lindsay. Her body was found in her Union City home and the main electrical line to the home had been cut which is believed to be how the attacker gained entry. Littrell had been strangled to death, suffered blunt force trauma, and been sexually assaulted. The second victim's body was discovered in 1996. The remains were identified as 46-year-old Winifred Douglas. Winifred was from the Oakland area. Her body was found along Highway 780 in Vallejo, California. Her cause of death was determined to be strangulation and blunt force trauma. The cases were connected in 2012 when new DNA evidence was found on Winifred's clothing. Ultimately, little is known about the two women whose lives were cut short, nor the circumstances of the 2021 attack. However, 
More information may be revealed down the line in further court proceedings. James Ray Gary was arrested at his home without incident. He was booked into the Solano County Jail on two charges of homicide. He's being held without bail while awaiting further court dates. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. On October 9, 2020, an officer in Idbell, Oklahoma, noticed a car driving recklessly. When he pulled the car over, he immediately sensed something was off. The woman inside was in a panic, covered in blood, and claimed she had just given birth on the side of the road. She said her baby wasn't breathing, so she was rushing to the hospital. The baby was very small and appeared blue. While waiting for an ambulance, they tried to help the woman. They noticed she was covered in dried blood, but there wasn't much blood in the car. They also found a placenta with an umbilical cord still attached. At the hospital, the woman was identified as 29-year-old Taylor Parker. She insisted she was overdue and had given birth alone in her car. However, based on the baby's size, medical staff estimated it to be around seven months old, not full term as Parker claimed. Parker allowed them to do a physical exam of her and quickly discovered that she didn't have a cervix or a uterus. Her medical records showed she had cancer in 2014 and had undergone a full hysterectomy. There was no way that this woman had birthed this baby. Meanwhile, in New Boston, Texas, a grisly crime scene was discovered. Jessica Brooks got a text message from her son-in-law, who was at work, to stop over at their house. He said that he received a couple of strange text messages from his wife, Reagan, and asked if they might stop by and check on his wife and three-year-old daughter. When Jessica arrived, she found blood everywhere. She called 911 and while on the phone with the dispatcher, discovered the three-year-old granddaughter was unharmed. 21-year-old Reagan Hancock was declared deceased at the scene. She had been seven and a half months pregnant and first responders discovered that the fetus had been cut from her body in an ugly botched delivery. Reagan had been severely beaten with a hammer and stabbed over 100 times with a scalpel that was found embedded in her throat. It was a horrific attack that had been extremely violent. Reagan's daughter had witnessed the entire attack. An Amber Alert was placed, and Oklahoma law enforcement quickly connected Reagan's murder with Taylor Parker's bizarre claims. A DNA test was taken and positively identified Reagan Hancock as the mother. The baby suffered severe brain damage due to lack of oxygen and ultimately died the next day. Reagan and her husband had named the baby Braxlin Sage. Parker was arrested and during a police interview, stated that she was a longtime friend with Reagan, which wasn't exactly true. Parker had been Reagan's wedding photographer and the two were friends on Facebook. Parker claimed that she went over to see Reagan that morning and the women got into a physical altercation and Reagan became so injured that she asked Parker to remove the baby to save it. A claim that was so outlandish and disproved by medical experts who maintained that Reagan was deceased when the baby was removed from her body. The subsequent investigation unraveled a massive web of lies. Parker's boyfriend believed that she was nine months pregnant Though Parker's family knew that she'd been lying about the pregnancy the entire time, as they knew that she'd had cervical cancer years before. According to those who knew the couple, they had been on the verge of breaking up when Parker miraculously became pregnant. But as the months went on, Parker apparently started becoming more desperate. Many assumed the pregnancy was going to end like so many fake pregnancies, with a spontaneous miscarriage. They had no idea Parker would resort to murder to keep her relationship going. In the week before Reagan was murdered, Parker had shown up to her birthing center she'd been to before and requested her medical records from her first two births, and then staff watched as she sat on a bench near the parking lot. It had later been determined that she had been recording the license plates of expecting mothers that she watched go in and out of the clinic, looking for a woman to attack. Detectives seized her computer and noted that in the days and hours before Reagan's murder, Parker had spent hours researching how to perform home births, birth protocols, and cesarean sections. Through her devices, it was determined that Parker had spent about two weeks planning Reagan's murder. Taylor Parker was charged with the murder of Reagan as well as Braxlin, in addition to charges of kidnapping. Parker pleaded not guilty and was held in custody until her trial in September 2022. When the jury ultimately found her guilty, 
She is now undergoing sentencing where the prosecution is requesting the death penalty. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Lisa Montgomery gained worldwide attention when she was discovered holding a newborn baby that had been forcibly removed from its mother, who was killed in a brutal attack. Because the crime involved crossing state lines, she faced charges that could lead to the death penalty for murder and kidnapping. Her victim, Bobby Joe Stanett, was tragically left to die on the floor. In 2004, Lisa Montgomery informed her second husband, children, and close family members that she was pregnant, which happened around Christmas time. However, it was later revealed that she had a history of falsely claiming pregnancies. Her sister mentioned that Lisa often lied about being pregnant and had actually undergone surgery to prevent pregnancy after a difficult experience in her early 20s. Lisa even went as far as using a fake ultrasound image she found online, editing it to make it appear genuine with her name on it. Her husband believed they had been trying to have a baby for years, unaware of her medical situation. Lisa never disclosed to him that she couldn't conceive. She had been caught on several occasions faking a pregnancy. Those around her believed that she was a pathological liar. Friends and family often witnessed her telling outright lies to basically anyone she came in contact with, even lying about small, insignificant things. She and her husband were rat terrier breeders. Lisa used a fake name in an online forum for rat terrier enthusiasts called Ratter Chatter, under the name Darlene Fisher. She posted that she wanted to purchase a puppy. A man in the chat room, Jason Dawson, connected her to a friend and fellow rat terrier breeder named Bobby Joe Stanett. He knew that one of her dogs had just had a litter of puppies and suggested a particular puppy that had red fur on December 15th. He passed on Bobby Joe's email address and phone number. At 23, Bobby Joe Stanett had her whole life ahead of her. She was newly married, eight months pregnant, and ran a successful dog breeding business with her husband. She and her husband, Jeb Stanett, were passionate about rat terriers and had actually met Lisa Montgomery and her husband at several dog shows. On the morning of December 16th, 2004, Bobby was home alone. She was waiting to meet a woman interested in one of her puppies. They had only communicated via email, but she felt safe inviting the woman into her home. The woman calling herself Darlene had also said that she was pregnant and they were due around the same time. When there was a knock at the door, Bobby allowed the woman into her home, then she made tea and they briefly chatted for a bit. But when Bobby turned around to go into the kitchen, Darlene pulled a neon pink rope from a baggy sweater and wrapped it around Bobby's neck. When Bobby passed out and fell to the ground, Lisa Montgomery cut open her abdomen. At some point during the incision, Bobby regained consciousness. There had been blood on the bottom of her feet, so much blood that it had pooled up and over her toes. Lisa moved behind her head and used a rope and pulled while Bobby was lying on the ground until Bobby again lost consciousness. Approximately an hour after the attack, Bobby's mother, Becky Harper, came by the house. She discovered Bobby on the floor called 911, told the operator that it looked like her stomach had exploded. First responders tried to revive Bobby, but their efforts were unsuccessful. She had lost too much blood. It was quickly discovered that the baby was no longer in the home, and it was noted that Bobby's umbilical cord had been cut. An Amber Alert was issued that day to enlist the public's help. When Kevin Montgomery, Lisa Montgomery's husband, was on the stand in her trial, he told the court that he'd heard the Amber Alert but didn't connect it to the baby his wife had come home with. He told the court his wife had told him that she'd been out shopping in Topeka on December 16, 2004 when she'd gone into labor and delivered the baby at a birth and growth center in Topeka. He said that he'd been led to believe it was his first child and he was excited. They spent most of December 17th showing off the baby at a cafe, a bank, and his parents' home. They named the baby Abigail. Police knocked on their door on the evening of December 17th. Police had used computer forensics to track down Lisa Montgomery using her IP address and communications with Bobby. They were also able to match her vehicle to a vehicle that neighbors had stated seeing near Bobby's house. Further investigation revealed that Lisa had researched for weeks on how to perform C-sections, where to cut and how to remove a baby and cut the umbilical cord. The baby was healthy despite her violent entrance into the world. 
She was reunited with her father and was named Victoria Jostinet. Police did do a DNA check just to validate the child was with their rightful parent. In her trial, the prosecutors argued that Montgomery's ex-husband knew that she was lying about her pregnancy and feared he would expose her. At the time, he sought custody of two of their four children, and she was convinced he would use it against her in court. Her defense argued that she had suffered a miscarriage and had taken the baby in a mental break. But given her level of preparedness and that Lisa had known she was not able to conceive, the jury didn't buy this defense. The jury convicted Montgomery of kidnapping, resulting in death, and four days later, she was sentenced to capital punishment. She was incarcerated at the Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. She remained there until her execution date. While there, she underwent several evaluations where experts determined that she had bipolar disorder and PTSD and was often in a disassociated reality. They also determined that she had permanent brain damage from physical abuse she experienced as a child. Her legal team had made several appeals, but all appeals were dismissed. Her sentence was carried out on December 13th, 2021. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. On April 23rd, 2019, 19-year-old Marlon Ochoa Lopez was reported missing in Chicago, Illinois. She was supposed to pick up her three-year-old son from daycare but never showed up. Her family became worried when they couldn't reach her, especially because it was unusual for her to disappear, especially considering she was nine months pregnant. Her black Honda Civic was also gone, raising concerns that she might have been in an accident. However, there were no records of any accidents or hospital visits involving Marlon. For weeks, her family searched for her without any leads on her whereabouts. On the same day Marlon went missing, a 46-year-old woman named Clarissa Figueroa called 911. She claimed to have given birth at home and said the baby wasn't breathing, so she needed an ambulance. Both Clarissa and the newborn were taken to the hospital, where the baby received medical treatment. Unfortunately, due to a lack of oxygen, the baby suffered severe brain damage. Initially, the hospital's priority was stabilizing and treating the infant, but in the days following their arrival, doctors started noticing things with Figueroa that didn't seem to match her story. She didn't show any signs of having just given birth. Medical records also showed that she'd had her tubes tied. However, little was done for days. The hospital eventually did do a DNA test and determined that Figueroa was not related to the infant. On May 7th, law enforcement was notified of a potential kidnapping. That linked them to Marlon's disappearance. On May 14th, law enforcement issued a search warrant for Figueroa's home, 21 days from Marlon's disappearance. While at the home, investigators found blood evidence, burned clothing, and digital evidence connecting Figueroa to Marlon. The two were both in a Facebook group called Help a Sister Out. Marlon had posted requesting baby items she needed. Figueroa had responded, claiming that she had items she didn't need, which included baby clothes. A second search of the home located Marlon's body, which was found in a garbage bin on the property, as well as her vehicle, which had multiple parking tickets on it. Clarissa Figueroa was arrested and confessed. Also arrested was her 24-year-old daughter Desiree Figueroa and her boyfriend, 40-year-old Petra Bobuk. It had been Clarissa who had planned the abduction for months, Desiree had distracted Marlon, and Clarissa had strangled her with a cord. The two women then surgically removed the infant and attempted to cover the crime scene before calling 911. After weeks in the hospital, the baby boy, later named Yovani JDL, was reunited with his family but he remained on life support for weeks and ultimately died due to extensive brain damage. Marlon's husband, Yovani Lopez, lost his wife and newborn. Heavy criticism fell on the hospital due to the slow response of involving law enforcement. Weeks had gone by before baby Yovani was removed from Figueroa's custody. What was worse was that the hospital billed the Lopez family $300,000 for medical expenses, with the baby's name being listed as Figueroa Boy. The Lopez family said that they had been devastated and further traumatized by the incident. A lawyer for the family stated that they had been told by the hospital that the costs had been waived and the hospital natal confirmed that the invoice had been sent by mistake. However, 
The Lopez family described the situation as atrocious and called out the hospital for its lack of humanity towards a grieving family. Clarissa and Desiree Figueroa were charged with murder in the first degree, aggravated kidnapping, aggravated battery of a child, and dismembering a body. They both pleaded not guilty and are being held in custody while they await further court dates. Bobuk was charged with concealing a homicidal death and obstruction of justice. He is also pleaded not guilty and remains in custody. A trial date has yet to be set at the time of recording. Marlon's family is committed to continuing to attend every court proceeding and keeping Marlon and Giovanni's horrific murder in the public eye to ensure there's justice for them. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. In 1981, Lieutenant Ronald Oliver worked for the Memphis Police Department for 20 years. He had a daughter named Paula from his first marriage and was married to Sandra for two years, with a stepson named Vic. They recently bought five acres of land, planning to build a log cabin. Despite having a safe desk job at the precinct, he still chose to go on patrol because he was dedicated and cared more about justice than office politics. Philip Ray Workman, born on June 1, 1953, had a tough childhood, moving around army bases with an absent mother and a harsh father. He ran away from home multiple times and was sent to a harsh reform school in Texas as a teenager. After being released at 17, his father helped him join the army. Workman was sent to California, and it was during this time that he first discovered drugs. Workman was discharged from the army in 1973. After leaving the army, he went almost immediately into prison, serving just over half of a five-year sentence for burglary and drug possession in Georgia. By 1981, Workman was married and had an eight-year-old daughter, Crystal. He also had a serious drug addiction. He left Columbus, Georgia, where he had been living with his family and working odd jobs to support them, and began hitchhiking and drifting throughout the Southeast. By August, he was in Memphis, Tennessee. On August 5, 1981, Workman was almost out of money and out of drugs. High on the last of the cocaine he had, he entered the Wendy's on North Thomas late that evening. He ordered a burger and lingered inside the restaurant for almost an hour. Around 10 p.m., closing time for the restaurant, Workman pulled out his 45 caliber pistol and herded the employees, as well as the one remaining customer, into the manager's office. He demanded money and was given the $1,170 the restaurant had on hand in a mixture of bills and coins. Since he had no means of escape, he demanded the car keys from one of the employees. He then spent a few minutes struggling to get the house key off of the keychain so that he could leave it with the person whose car he was in the process of stealing. One of the teenage employees, who had been told to sit on the floor of the office, told Workman that he had a cramp in his leg and needed to stand up. Workman told him that was all right. When the employee stood up, he was able to reach and activate a silent alarm. Lieutenant Oliver's position within the department meant that he did not have to respond to alarm calls. However, he was close to the Wendy's and, according to one of his co-workers, he generally had a get kind of attitude. When he pulled him to the Wendy's parking lot, Lieutenant Oliver was the first on the scene. As Lieutenant Oliver arrived in the parking lot, Workman was just walking to the exit of the restaurant. Lieutenant Oliver did not immediately realize that Workman was the robber. It appears that Lieutenant Oliver mistook Workman for the night janitor at the Wendy's because he announced over the radio that the call appeared to be a false alarm and that the cleanup crew was coming out. At roll call at the beginning of his shift, the lieutenant had been reminded, along with the other officers coming on to shift, to be on the lookout for an African-American man who had been robbing fast food restaurants at closing time in the neighborhood. Lieutenant Oliver may have assumed that this robbery was part of that spree and not identified Workman as a suspect because he did not meet the description of the individual who had been robbing area restaurants. Lieutenant Oliver and Workman began walking out of the restaurant. As a second police officer, Officer Aubrey Stoddard arrived on the scene. However, the situation quickly deteriorated. Workman tried to make a run for it as he exited the Wendy's and was ordered to stop. At this point, Workman's account and Officer Stoddard's account become very different. Workman's account is problematic not only because it is in his best interest to make himself look innocent, but also because he was high at the time, and by his own admission, 
his recollection of that night is impaired. According to Workman's account, he tripped on the curb that separated the Wendy's parking from that of the neighboring Holiday Auto Parts store as he tried to escape. Hearing the officers catching up to him, he decided to surrender. Kneeling near the curb, he yelled, I give up, and took the gun from his pants to surrender it. He was then hit over the head with a flashlight, and the gun went off, shooting a bullet straight up into the air. He then heard gunfire from behind him and took off running. He cocked his weapon, which discharged a live round. A few moments later, he tripped, and his gun fired again. According to Officer Stoddard, after workmen tried to escape, Lieutenant Oliver caught up and grabbed him from behind. Officer Stoddard then ran up and grabbed workmen from the front. Workman then took out his weapon, which left it sandwiched between his stomach and Officer Stoddard's. Workman then fired the gun, striking Officer Stoddard in the arm. The shot sent Officer Stoddard flying backwards. He says he heard Workman firing wildly at this time, emptying his revolver. By the time he got up, Lieutenant Oliver was wounded on the ground, firing his weapon in Workman's direction. He saw Workman leap over a fence and go into an adjacent neighborhood. Eventually, the evidence collected at the scene would match closer to Workman's account, at least in terms of the number of shots he fired. Two spent cartridges and a live round were found closer to where Workman had struggled with the officers. And one was found near where Workman claims to have tripped in the auto parts store parking lot and fired again. This does leave one cartridge unaccounted for, and maybe from the bullet that wounded Officer Stoddard. Shooting Officer Stoddard is absent from Workman's account. Civilian witnesses did also report seeing Workman running across the store parking lot, clutching his head wound with his right hand, which also held the stolen bag of money and a jacket. His gun was in his left, non-dominant hand. The third officer on the scene, Officer Stephen Parker, had arrived on the scene at approximately the same time as Officer Stoddard and followed him into the parking lot. Having been trained to block all the entrances when responding to this kind of call, he stopped on the south side of the building because he saw Officer Stoddard drive around to the north side of the building. He tried the door to the restaurant, but it was locked. He then heard two gunshots and ran to the other side of the building. Lieutenant Oliver was already on the ground, and he saw a workman shoot Officer Stoddard. He says he could not pull out his own weapon because his holster had slid around, so he called out to workman instead. Officer Parker lost sight of workman after he ducked behind the parked pickup truck he had been standing near, startled by the arrival of another officer. Officer Parker ran to Lieutenant Oliver, who was already turning blue. After the shooting was called in over the radio, the Wendy's parking lot was quickly swarmed with police officers and paramedics. Lieutenant Oliver was transported to the hospital, suffering from one gunshot wound that went completely through his chest cavity. Despite the best efforts of doctors and nurses, Lieutenant Oliver died as a result of the gunshot wound. He was only 43 years old. The area around the Wendy's was searched with dogs, helicopters, and police officers on foot for workmen. A witness saw him hiding under a truck and helped narrow down the search area. When workmen was eventually discovered amongst a group of bushes, police dogs were given the command to attack him. He was taken to the hospital to receive seven stitches for a head wound and to be treated for shotgun wounds to his backside as well as dog bites. He was then taken to jail, where he began experiencing the symptoms of drug withdrawal. On May 11, 1982, Workman was found guilty of the felony murder of Lieutenant Ronald Oliver. He was sentenced to death. Workman was represented by public defenders at his trial. He would later sue them for negligence, although the court ruled that they had done their jobs adequately. Workman claims that they were of the opinion that if he did not object to the facts as presented by the prosecution, they had a slim chance of getting Workman life in prison, rather than the death penalty. They did not question the prosecution's main eyewitness, attack any inconsistencies, and the statements made by officers Stoddard and Parker, and did not look at any of the ballistics evidence. Workman spent the rest of the 80s and 90s going through the lengthy appeals process required of death row inmates. These proceedings did little to actually challenge Workman's death sentence until 1990, when he got new legal representation. By the end of the decade, there will be serious doubts about whether or not Philip Workman actually shot Lieutenant Oliver on that night in 1981. 
The major debate surrounding this case involves whether or not a bullet from Workman's gun could have been the bullet that killed Lieutenant Oliver. This is important because Workman was sentenced to death for the felony murder of Lieutenant Oliver. Workman has never denied his culpability in the armed robbery. Fired .45 caliber silver tip hollow point ammunition. This type of ammunition generally expands once it enters the human body. Mushrooming out as pressure around the inner edge causes it to expand. As a result, this type of bullet tends to stay inside the body rather than exit it. On occasions where it does exit a body, the exit wound is usually larger than the entrance wound due to the bullet's expansion. At Lieutenant Oliver's autopsy, it was determined that the bullet that killed him entered the left side of his chest, going through his seventh rib, and exited the right side of his back between his fifth and sixth ribs, striking his heart as it passed through his chest. The surface area of the entrance wound was almost three times the surface area of the exit wound. This could still be explained by the fact that hollow point ammunition often fragments as it expands. There was no evidence of additional wound paths found during Lieutenant Oliver's autopsy, however. An additional way to see if this fragmentation had occurred would be to examine an X-ray taken at Lieutenant Oliver's autopsy. Autopsy X-rays were not necessarily routine in 1981, as the Memphis morgue did not have the equipment to take them and had to enlist the help of a hospital when they were taken. Workman's lawyers asked for any films taken at the autopsy in preparation for his trial, and again in 1990 and in 1995. They were never turned over by the medical examiner's office. But this did not necessarily raise suspicion, as there was no guarantee that such images existed. In 2000, while preparing for a clemency hearing, Workman's lawyers happened to notice a reference Dr. O.C. Smith, the chief medical examiner for Shelby County, made to x-rays taken during the autopsy in a letter he had written in reference to the hearing. An x-ray had been taken at Lieutenant Oliver's autopsy after all. The x-ray did not show any bullet fragments left behind in Lieutenant Oliver's body, supporting the possibility that a .45 caliber bullet did not kill Lieutenant Oliver. According to Dr. Smith, the x-ray had simply been misplaced. The county morgue had been displaced due to a fire at the time of Lieutenant Oliver's autopsy and had moved facilities a few years after that. The only reason he had the x-ray was because of diligent research by some of his co-workers at his request. They apparently were not so diligent when trying to locate it to comply with court orders filed by the defense. Dr. Smith also did not make the x-ray available to the defense when it was given to him, arguing that he had no way of knowing that they would want to see it, because he had been on active duty with the Navy Reserves when the 1995 court order was filed. Workman's lawyers in turn argued that the medical examiner's office had deliberately withheld the x-ray. While preparing a report for use against him, meets any definition of egregious that one consults, they claimed in a court motion. The court cannot condone fraud, particularly when the fraud aims at executing a man who is innocent of capital murder. Borkman's defense lawyers had two prominent forensic experts whose testimony supported the theory that Lieutenant Oliver was not shot with a .45 caliber bullet. Dr. Chris Sperry, the chief medical examiner for the state of Georgia, and Dr. Cyril Wecht, the coroner for Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, who had consulted on many high-profile cases and previously served on the forensic pathology panel for the U.S. House of Representatives Select Committee on Assassinations. Dr. Sperry first became involved with the case in 1995 and testified at a clemency hearing for Workman in 2000. According to Dr. Sperry, Lieutenant Oliver's wounds are inconsistent with every wound I have seen created by a 45 silver tip hollow point bullet. Dr. Weck testified at a 2001 hearing that he believed within a reasonable degree of medical certainty that the bullets from Workman's gun could not have caused the injuries that killed Lieutenant Oliver. According to Dr. Weck, the injuries were more consistent with those caused by a .38 caliber bullet, the kind of ammunition used by the Memphis Police Department in 1981. This is one of the numerous controversial aspects of this case. In asserting his innocence, Workman is claiming that Lieutenant Oliver was killed as the result of friendly fire, being shot accidentally by one of his fellow officers. While there are inconsistencies between the accounts of the night of August 5, 1981, given by Officer Stoddard and Parker, they agree on two major points. Neither of them saw Lieutenant Oliver get shot, and no one besides Workman and Lieutenant Oliver fired a weapon at the scene. 
There are reports that neither Stoddard nor Parker's weapons were tested after Lieutenant Oliver's death, but it does appear that Officer Stoddard's weapon was tested and shown to have not been fired. A civilian witness named Steve Craig contradicts the assertion that Parker did not fire any weapon that night. Steve was friends with Officer Stoddard and saw him pulling into the Wendy's parking lot. Steve did not witness Lieutenant Oliver getting shot, as he had ducked down in his car when he heard gunshots. He did, however, see Officer Parker firing a shotgun at Workman. This account is seemingly corroborated by the fact that Workman had shotgun wounds when he arrived at the hospital. Steve required emergency surgery for appendicitis in 1982, which prevented him from testifying at Workman's trial. In 1995, he provided Workman's lawyers with a signed affidavit describing what he had seen. He also claimed that he had been told by the police that there was no need to talk about this, unless it was with someone from the department. The Sixth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals would eventually rule that while Steve Craig's account was troubling, it was not relevant because he did not see Officer Parker via the shotgun until after Lieutenant Oliver was shot. In 2000, Dr. O.C. Smith dismissed the diagnosis of the doctors who treated Workman in 1981 and argued, based on a photograph of Workman's wounds, that they were just additional dog bites sustained during his apprehension. Lieutenant Oliver was not killed with a shotgun, so the presence of such a weapon at the scene does not directly support the friendly fire theory. However, it does imply that the account given by the two surviving officers does not provide a full inventory of the weapons in play at the scene. This implication is also, according to Workman's lawyers, supported by a bullet hole in a pickup truck parked in the Holiday Auto Parts parking lot, not far from where Lieutenant Oliver fell when he was shot. The bullet hole was photographed and listed in police reports as being from a .38 caliber bullet, but the bullet hole does not appear to have been fully forensically examined. As best as Workman's lawyers can tell from the photographs, the bullet hit the car at an angle indicating that it could not have been shot from Lieutenant Oliver's gun. The bullet cannot be tested because for some reason it was never collected from inside of the truck. According to the Memphis police, this was because the truck was locked. For some reason, the car was not impounded until the owner could be found and the police could gain entry into the vehicle. Without forensic analysis of this bullet to determine what gun it was fired from, Workman's lawyers can argue for the possibility that an unaccounted 438 was being fired at the scene. The general consensus in this case is that the bullet that killed Lieutenant Oliver has never been found. At Workman's 2000 clemency hearing, Dr. Smith argued that the bullet had been found at the scene. A deformed .45 caliber bullet had been found near the curb that divided the Wendy's and the auto parts store parking lots. The bullet was 104 feet past where Lieutenant Oliver had fallen. According to Dr. Smith, this means that the bullet had passed through Lieutenant Oliver, because this type of ammunition would normally travel much farther, and the shortened travel distance shows that its speed had been hampered by hitting something. However, to prove that Workman shot the bullet at Lieutenant Oliver, Dr. Smith assumes that Workman shot the bullet at Lieutenant Oliver. The bullet is only 104 feet past Lieutenant Oliver if we assume that it came from Workman's position. The bullet was also found near where Workman says his gun went off accidentally the first time, sending a bullet straight up in the air. Dr. Smith performed an experiment using a dog's rib cage and ballistics gelatin that showed that an unexpanded .45 caliber hollow point bullet would be deformed if it passed through a body. His experiments did not prove, however, that this would be the only scenario in which the bullet could become deformed. The bullet could have been damaged upon hitting the ground after being shot straight up and falling back down to the ground. As Dr. Smith correctly points out, the bullet was fired from Workman's gun to the exclusion of all other guns in the world, which we know because of tests performed on Workman's gun by the FBI. However, this still does not prove that it is the bullet that killed Lieutenant Oliver. In his testimony, Dr. Smith does not acknowledge that other tests on the bullet performed by the FBI showed no signs of blood or tissue on it. There is no physical evidence showing that the bullet ever struck a person in general, or Lieutenant Oliver specifically. Besides the ballistics evidence, the other major point of contention in this case is the prosecution's main witness at the 1982 trial, Harold Davis. Davis called the police the day after Lieutenant Oliver's death and told them that he had been in the Wendy's parking lot the night before, and that he had been just 10 feet away when Workman shot Lieutenant Oliver. 
He testified at trial that Workman had calmly pointed his gun at Lieutenant Oliver and shot him. The problem with Davis's testimony is that there is no actual indication that he was in the Wendy's parking lot. Davis claimed to have been in his car during the shooting and that he fled on foot, coming back for his car in the morning. His car is not seen nor is it in any diagram drawn of the scene by the police on the night of the shooting. None of the police officers at the scene saw him, nor did any of the five civilian witnesses in the area. It is hard to imagine that he was able to leave the scene without being noticed, or how he was allowed to once other officers arrived at the scene. Vivian Porter, a family friend of Davis's, also came forward after the trial saying that she knew Davis wasn't at the scene of the crime that night because she had been with him. She says she had been unaware of Davis's involvement in the trial. According to Vivian Porter, she and Davis had been out buying drugs, not far from the Wendy's on North Thomas, on the night of Lieutenant Oliver's death. They were pulled over by a policeman, but before he came up to speak with them, he got a call on his radio and got back into his car and took off. Vivian and Davis drove past the Wendy's a little later in the evening and saw the heavy police presence there, and assumed that the officer who had stopped them had left to respond according to Davis's sister. He had a habit of calling in tips to the police about cases he had seen in the paper to try to get reward money that he could use to fund his drug habit. Davis left Memphis after the trial, living a transient lifestyle. Workman's new defense lawyers had wanted to speak to him since they were put on the case in 1990, but they would not have the chance until 1999, when they tracked him down to Phoenix, Arizona. In both a written and a videotaped statement, Davis admitted to lying about being in the and seeing Philip Workman shoot Lieutenant Oliver. His account of the night of Lieutenant Oliver's death differs from the one provided by Vivian Porter. Davis says they were sitting at a parking lot across the street from the Wendy's, smoking marijuana at the time of the shooting, but they were facing away from the scene. Davis says he was able to pick Workman out of a photo lineup because he had already seen his picture in the paper by the time police brought him in to speak to them. He alleges that the police explained the details of the crime to him and asked if he would testify to those facts. He agreed, but changed his mind as the trial got closer and expressed his concerns to the police. He claims that after he did, a large man came to visit him, telling Davis that he and those close to him could be made to disappear if he did not testify as he had been told to. According to Davis, this is why he left the state after the trial. Harold Davis is not a very reliable witness. While I am skeptical of his claims that he was threatened and coached by the police, I am equally skeptical of his claims that he witnessed Lieutenant Oliver being shot. Don Struther, one of the original prosecutors of the case, has said that he still believes Davis testified truthfully at the trial in 1982, even after hearing Davis's new statements. After hearing about the ballistics evidence and learning about Harold Davis's perjured testimony, five out of the 12 jurors, who convicted Workman and voted to impose the death penalty, signed affidavits saying that they would have changed their vote on the verdict, the sentence, or both. If this information had been available at the time, Workman's lawyers were very vocal in the media about the doubts about Workman's guilt, and he began to receive support from the public. He also received support from a source most people probably would not have expected, Lieutenant Oliver's daughter, Paula Dedilia. Both Miss Dedilia and her mother, Lieutenant Oliver's first wife, did not wish to see Workman executed. Miss Dedilia publicly appealed for Workman's sentence to be reduced and for the new evidence in the case to be thoroughly examined, which I have to imagine was an emotionally taxing undertaking. Ms. Dedilia wrote a letter to the governor for Workman's clemency hearing in 2000, and also appeared in a video appeal to him, asking that Workman's sentence be commuted to life in prison. My belief, my feelings are, that Mr. Workman did not kill my father, and if so, I do not believe it was intentional, and I would like to see his sentence be reduced to at least life. She said in her taped statement, I know it's odd for me to be saying this, but it seems like there's a lot of questionable things relating to this case, and I would like to see someone look into it further. She also appeared at a news conference in 2000 with Workman's daughter Crystal, telling the press, Taking her father will not bring mine back. While I have the utmost respect for Ms. Dedilia for the strength and compassion she showed by taking the stance she did, I do not want that respect to be interpreted as disrespect for those in Lieutenant Oliver's family, who did not agree with her. Not everyone Lieutenant Oliver left behind shared Ms. Dedilia's views. 
Sandra Oliver Noblin, Lieutenant Oliver's wife at the time of his death, believed Workman was guilty and supported his execution. In a statement prepared for Workman's clemency hearing in 2000, she argued, clemency should not be an option for a person who takes another person's life. Philip Workman is not innocent of this murder. He killed Ronnie. In the same statement, she questioned how her former stepdaughter could reach her conclusions about her father's murderer, but acknowledged that Mr. Dillia's opinion was her privilege in her choice between her and her God. There have been a lot of concerns raised over the behavior of and decisions made by the courts and public officials in regards to this case. Given the vast number of court appearances Workman made over the 25 years following his nor, is it probably helpful? For the purpose of this video, we will just be examining Workman's 2001 evidentiary hearing to illustrate why some of these concerns arose. Due to the various legal challenges Workman and his defense team posed beyond the standard appellate proceedings required of inmates condemned to death, his execution date was set and then deferred several times over the years. On March 30, 2001, Workman's execution was deferred less than an hour before it was scheduled to occur. Workman's lawyers had petitioned for a writ of error quorum nobis in Shelby County Criminal Court. In the state of Tennessee, this type of writ is issued in criminal proceedings for evidence discovered after the trial. The evidence has to relate to issues raised at the trial. A judge has to rule that the evidence could have resulted in a different verdict at the trial, that it is reliable, and that the defendant is not at fault for failing to discover the evidence sooner. The judge denied the petition. At 12.37 a.m., however, the Tennessee Supreme Court overturned the lower court's decision. The court was of the opinion that due process requires that Workman be granted a hearing to evaluate his claims that new evidence, which was unavailable at trial and which has never been evaluated in a hearing in this state's courts, shows that he is actually innocent of capital murder, according to the order it released. The order was issued at 12.37 a.m. Workman's execution had been scheduled for 1 a.m., the Tennessee Supreme Court decision sent the case back to the judge who had originally denied the petition for an evidentiary hearing to fully examine the ballistic evidence and the evidence that Harold Davis had committed perjury at the original trial. That judge was Judge John P. Colton Jr. Judge Colton had also been the judge at Workman's trial in 1982. Judge Colton and Workman's lawyers had issues before the hearing even began. When the case was sent back to him, Judge Colton scheduled the hearing for just two weeks later, which gave Workman's lawyers only that small amount of time to prepare for it. That decision was overturned on appeal. Judge Colton ordered Workman's lawyers to turn over a videotape statement made by Harold Davis to the prosecution. This tape should not have been made available to them until after Davis testified. Judge Colton's order was overturned on appeal. Judge Colton issued a gag order preventing the attorneys from communicating about the case outside of court. Judge Colton's order was overturned on appeal. Believing that these actions showed that Judge Colton was biased against Workman, Workman's attorneys asked him to recuse himself from the hearing. Judge Colton refused. It has been alleged that Judge Colton failed to protect the witnesses the defense presented at the hearing. DA Jerry Kitchen was allegedly verbally abusive to both Harold Davis and Dr. Cyril Wecht, but Judge Colton said nothing about his method of questioning. Judge Colton also barred Wardy Parks, one of the jurors from Workman's trial, who said that he would not have found Workman guilty or sentenced him to death in light of the ballistics evidence and the perjured testimony, who had also testified at Workman's 2000 clemency hearing, from testifying at this hearing. On one hand, this ruling makes sense, as Mr. Parks could not provide new evidence in the case. On the other, however, the defense could have used his testimony to confirm that the new evidence would have changed the outcome of the trial, as they needed to for their petition to be successful. On January 7, 2002, Judge Colton ruled against Workman, stating that the new evidence presented by lawyers for death row inmate Philip Workman is insufficient to warrant a new trial. He found that Harold Davis's testimony did not amount to a recantation of his original trial testimony. Robert Hutton, one of Workman's lawyers, had gone over Davis's trial testimony line by line, and Davis had refuted each line of it. During the two days of questioning by D.A. Kitchen, however, he often claimed to have memory issues when asked specific questions and refused to say directly that he had lied under oath. Davis had to be rushed to the hospital after his testimony concluded allegedly because D.A. Kitchen was so abusive in his questioning. 
Judge Colton also held that the ballistics evidence did not merit a new trial because Dr. Wecht could not conclusively exclude the possibility that a .45 caliber bullet caused a fatal wound. Even after viewing the autopsy x-ray, Workman was given a new execution date of September 24, 2003. On September 15, 2003, Tennessee Governor Phil Bredesen granted Workman a four-month reprieve. When that reprieve was about to expire, he extended it by another three months. The reason for the reprieve turned out to be a federal investigation and a Shelby County medical examiner, Dr. O.C. Smith. Dr. Smith had testified at a clemency hearing for Workman in 2000, and at the evidentiary hearing presided under Judge Colton in 2001. At both hearings, he argued against the testimony of Dr. Sperry and Wecht, maintaining that Workman's gun was the murder weapon. In June of 2002, Dr. Smith had been discovered bound with barbed wire with a bomb around his neck at the Regional Forensic Center. He claimed he had been attacked by an unknown assailant. Workman's case was originally considered to be a motive in the attack, and Workman was interviewed as part of the investigation. By the fall of 2003, however, Dr. Smith was being investigated for staging the attack himself. He was indicted on federal charges in February 2004 and went to trial in 2005. A video detailing this case will be linked in the description. Governor Bredesen did not extend Workman's reprieve any further because he had state medical examiner Dr. Bruce Levy, who coincidentally would go on to face his own legal troubles, in Workman's case, in light of the issue of Dr. Smith's credibility being raised by his indictment. Dr. Levy did not report any inaccuracies in Dr. Smith's testimony in either hearing, so Bredesen allowed plans for Workman's execution to move forward. The various appeals and proceedings delaying Workman's execution ran out in 2007. On May 4th, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit refused to grant Workman a stay of execution. That same day, however, a U.S. District Court issued a temporary restraining order, barring the state of Tennessee from executing Workman. The restraining order was issued due to issues with the state's lethal injection procedures. In February of 2007, Governor Bredesen had rescinded Tennessee's instruction manual for lethal injections, citing deficiencies in the procedures it outlined. The manuals still require procedures for execution by electrocution, even though it was supposed to be specifically for executions using lethal injection. The state's commissioner of correction had 90 days to write a new manual. The revised procedures were released on April 30th. Workman's lawyers were granted the restraining order so that they would have a chance to question if the new procedures were constitutional. At a hearing on May 7th, however, the restraining order was vacated by the U.S. Court for Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Philip Workman was moved to Death Watch inside the Riverbend Maximum Security Institution. At 10 p.m. on May 8th, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear an appeal from Workman. At 12.15 a.m. on May 9th, the Tennessee Supreme Court refused to hear an appeal from Workman's lawyers, asking for additional time to review the state's new injection procedures. For his last meal, Workman had asked for a vegetarian pizza. Instead of having it brought to him, however, he asked that the pizza be taken to the nearby city of Nashville and given to a homeless person instead. The prison denied the request because taxpayer funds cannot be used for charity. Workman refused to select another last meal for himself in protest and did not take the prison's standard meal tray when it was brought to him at 4.50 p.m. on May 8th. His actual last meal, as it were, was at 9.40, when he asked for and was brought grape juice while he met with a spiritual advisor. When word of Workman's denied last meal reached the public, people from around the country decided to fulfill his request. The COVID-19 crisis and homeless shelters in Nashville, like the Oasis Center and the Nashville Rescue Mission, became inundated with donations of vegetarian pizzas that had been ordered from all over the country. Pizzas were also sent by PETA President Ingrid Newkirk and a radio station in Minnesota. In Memphis, the Destiny Diner ran a promotion for the rest of the month of May, allowing people to buy their vegetable pizza at half price, with all the pizzas being donated to an area homeless shelter in the beginning of June. We don't condone violence or crime of any kind, and it's not our place to comment on workman's sentence or execution, said Destiny Diner employee Hart Simha but we do believe that his last request was honorable. Any excuse to feed the homeless is a good one, 
Workman's execution was scheduled for 1 a.m. on May 9, 2007. After he was trapped to the gurney in the execution chamber, curtains were opened to allow witnesses in another room to view the execution. Asked Workman if he had any final words. I've prayed to the Lord Jesus Christ not to lay charge of my death to any man. Workman, who had become a born-again Christian in the early 1990s, replied. He then closed his eyes, and the process of injecting him with the appointed cocktail of drugs began. Approximately two minutes later, he said, I commend my spirit into your hands, Lord Jesus Christ. According to the witnesses, he at that point appeared to become unconscious. Workman was declared dead. At 1.38 a.m., almost 26 years after the death of Lieutenant Ronald Oliver. Lieutenant Oliver's widow, Sandra Oliver Noblin, and her son Vic were present at the execution. Workman's older brother Terry planned to attend, but decided at the last minute not to witness the execution. I did not make this video to try to persuade anyone one way or the other about Philip Workman's guilt or innocence. I do not know if he was guilty or not, and I would never claim to, I personally do wish that there had been a new trial, however, or some other way for the controversial evidence to have been more fully evaluated in a neutral setting. I think this case was important to cover because it, like many other cases, shows just how politics and perspective play major roles in the criminal justice system. Prosecuting criminals is not as straightforward of a process as many of us would like to believe. Especially now in the age of DNA and advanced forensics, it is easy to assume that if a scientist claims that forensic tests say something is true, it must be true. This case reminds us that two different experts can look at the same evidence and arrive at completely different conclusions. Two different experts can look at the same evidence and tell two completely different stories about what happened at a crime scene. The same can be said about lawyers and judges. Different interpretations of the law and of legal statutes can result in vastly different rulings and opinions on how a case should be handled. I hope that the conflicting opinions and strong feelings held by the various legal and scientific experts in this case remind us all how vital it is to think critically about cases. My other major reason for covering this case is Lieutenant Oliver, especially in the early 2000s. As the controversy about the X-ray and Harold Davis's testimony was coming to light, this case was featured heavily in the local news in Memphis, where I grew up. I remember hearing about the case all the time, and knowing that Workman was on death row for killing a cop. But I never knew that cop's name until a few years ago when I looked it up on my own. Between the anger, politics, accusations, and questions involved in this case, I fear that the focus of the case has shifted away from the man we lost. I believe the way in which cases are covered has changed in the past several years, and that the focus has been put back on the victims of violent crime. We are becoming more sensitive to the identity of a crime victim beyond what someone else did to them, and the unique void their loss leaves behind. Having been killed in 1981, Lieutenant Oliver has not benefited from this change. The one picture of him I have shown in this video is seemingly the only one publicly available. After a lot of digging, I was able to find one more of him being loaded into the ambulance on the night of his death, but it hardly shows him and it seemed inappropriate to share in this video. Almost all of the information I shared about Lt. Oliver, beyond his job and rank, came from one article published in 2000. I wish I could share more about who Lt. Oliver was as a person, because from what I can tell he was a good man who deserves the respect of being remembered. Even though there is so little direct information available for us to learn about who Lt. Oliver was, we can still infer a lot about him from the legacy he leaves behind. A daughter who seemingly inherited his bravery and sense of justice. A widow with strong convictions and even stronger faith. And a stepson who joined him in law enforcement, going on to become a captain in the Bartlett, Tennessee Police Department. I am sure that viewers of this video will have conflicting opinions about this case. But I am also sure that we all agree that Lt. Oliver's loss is tragic. Some of you may feel disheartened that Workman was executed without a new trial, and others of you may feel anger at me for sharing the doubts raised about Workman's guilt. But my hope is that the main feeling you take away from this video is gratitude for Lt. Oliver's service and respect for his memory. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the depths of unsolved mysteries. Cold cases not only challenge our understanding of the past, but also ignite our curiosity and determination for answers. Remember to subscribe to stay updated on our latest investigations. 
And if you have any information regarding the cases we've covered, don't hesitate to reach out. Together, we can shed light on the shadows of the past and bring closure to those who seek it. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay curious, and never stop seeking the truth.